Welcome back. This is part two of lecture two. And in this uh, section, in the second part of the lecture on plague discourse in early modern England, I'm going to talk about two opposing religious perspectives on the plague, those of Hinnock, Clapham, and Lancelot Anders. And uh, both are religious perspectives, but they are very different from each other. The positions Clapham and Andrews take on the plague are socially and politically significant. The arguments they lay out don't remain in the realm of religious doctrine. They have topical significance. That is, they deal with things that were actually happening in London and England at the time by government authorities and by individual Londoners. And to me, that makes their writing particularly interesting. Uh, Hinnock Clapman uh, was a minister in London during the plague year of 1603, and that year he published a tract called An Epistle Discoursing Upon the Present Pestilence. And in that 31-page tract, he expresses doubt that the plague is contagious at all, which was not a common view. Most people did believe the plague was contagious, even if they also believed that no one could die of the plague if they weren't chosen by God to do so. Clapham also writes that only atheists, mere naturians, and other ignorant persons do hold it to be a natural disease, proceeding from natural causes only, as from corruption of air, caused by unreasonable planets above or else from carrion late stinking smells here below. That is, to translate what he's saying, he says that only atheists or people who believe that the natural order, not the divine, not divine providence, is the dominant power or force in the world, believe that the plague proceeds from natural causes only. That is from infected air, from the conjunction of the planets, from the smells of dead corpses, etc. So he basically insults natural philosophers or scientists as atheists, which is counter to the forward movement of scientific inquiry in 17th century Europe, which tried at the time to balance empirical inquiry with an understanding that while God's providence was the prime mover of all that happened on earth, it was appropriate and possible to study secondary natural causes, that is to study what we would call science. But Clapham did not attempt to balance primary and secondary causes. And from his perspective, to understand the plague as spread by natural causes was to limit or to deny God's very deliberate choice of who was targeted by these. It also, in his view, discouraged people from performing the Christian duties to others because people fearful of catching the plague would shun those who were sick rather than visit them and help them. So his anti-contagion position also had an element of Christian charity to it. Clapham also complained that the idea that the plague was contagious encouraged people whom he called ungodly to think they could escape the plague by fleeing to the countryside, when in fact, According to him, God's vengeance could not be stopped or limited in this way. Now, that might seem like a relatively benign commentary, but there were political and social implications to it. Uh, particularly because the wealthy of the city could and indeed did leave the city to get away from the plague and avoid catching it. And this was a somewhat controversial practice because, of course, so many people could not leave the city, having no money to do so, and nowhere in the countryside where they could go. So Clapham is critiquing those wealthy elites and naming them as ungodly and suggesting that they think they can control God's will 
by leaving the by leaving the city and getting away. So uh, Clapham was by no means the only writer to take a stance against the controversial practice of fleeing London during plague times. Other preachers also wrote and preached that God teaches people not to flee evil and infected places, but rather to leave off from sin. And other preachers also suggested that it was a kind of blasphemy to try to evade God's will by fleeing. And that these people were trying to limit God's power to smite or protect whomever he pleased by running away from England, from London, excuse me. And they also suggested, along with Clapham, that the righteous shouldn't fear to remain in the city uh, and that they were breaking the bonds of religion, community, family, and friendship by leaving people behind and going to the countryside. And it wasn't just religious commentators who criticized the allure able and did leave London to avoid the plague. The playwright and pamphlet writer Thomas Decker wrote a lot about the plague and uh, in one of his plague pamphlets of 1625, A Rod for Runaways, he speaks scornfully of those who were merry in their country houses. And he warns that God's arm, like a girdle going round the world, has no limit in its reach. Now, Decker definitely did not have those resources himself to leave London. He was always broke and he spent uh, quite a lot of time in debtor's prison. Um, in his prose pamphlet, The Wonderful Year, another plague pamphlet from 1603, he imagines a father leaving London for the countryside with his son uh, and believing that he has escaped the plague and saved them both. And then he describes the son dying anyway, and the father's initial relief and merriment turning into terrible grief. And this is the rather horrific passage I'm going to read. Now thy soul is jocund and thy senses merry, but open thine eyes, thou fool. And behold that darling of thine eye, thy son, turned suddenly into a lump of clay. The hand of pestilence hath smote him even under thy wing. Now doest thou rent thine hair, blaspheme thy creator, curest thy creation, and basely descendest thou into brutish and unmanly passion, threatening in despite of death and his plague to maintain the memory of thy child in the everlasting breath breast of marble. So you can see real anger in Decker's words, a real resentment towards those who had the resources to leave London and the plague behind. Um, his, his words here display an attitude of, you know, don't think you can get away free just because you've left London. God can still get you wherever you are and you can still be struck down by plague. I think the resentment is understandable in some ways, but the imagining of a father facing the death of his son after getting him out of London to keep him safe is really kind of nasty. Um, but it is a good illustration of how strongly people could feel about the issue of who was able to leave London for safety and who got left behind. So the, the Puritan minister Clapham in criticizing people leaving London was, he was in part speaking up for the poor or simply the non-elite people of London. Not only did a lot of magistrates, ministers, and physicians leave the city, whatever shopkeepers and provisioners who could flee did flee. So there were also food shortages in London to compound the overall misery. <laughs> 
Clapham also criticized, either directly or by insinuation, the plague orders that the government was enforcing. Um, the government policies in London were restrictive. You know, I talked about that last day. But of course, since those who could leave did, it was the poor and the less well off who bore the brunt of the restrictive policies and were essentially imprisoned in a city where an epidemic raged. Uh, Clapham's criticisms of those who fled London functioned on two levels. On the one hand, his insistence that it was not contagion, but God's divine decision that determined who became ill, meant that those who fled were guilty of trying to remove themselves from God's reach, which could be considered blasphemous. And on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, he um, was, you know, because many public officials and ministers' positions left the city, this was also, in Clapham's view, the abandonment of their responsibilities and of their Christian duties to their fellow Londoners. So I just want to pause here to reflect on how relevant this seems to our current pandemic situation, during which there have been all kinds of controversies surrounding issues of travel. And there have, of course, been advisories all over Canada about not traveling outside of one's immediate region in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. And quite a lot of anger uh, by those who have adhered to these restrictions um, towards those who have not. And that anger um, of 17th century Londoners that we see in Clapham, we see in Decker towards public officials, ministers, physicians, anybody who would leave the city. It reminds me a lot of the anger of ordinary Canadians towards politicians. Um, after our recent December holidays, it emerged that despite the restrictions against mental travel, a whole host of politicians jetted off to sunny climates. While most people in Canada didn't eat turkey with their families and visited with loved ones via Zoom or FaceTime only. And in this slide, I, I've typed up an incomplete list of those political figures and you can go through that on your own. I'm certainly not gonna name them all here. Um, but uh, most of them went to very warm places. It, it was a huge scandal, especially in Alberta, where the numbers of politicians in the governing United Conservative Party who traveled were especially high. And uh, it was made worse by a couple of things. Um, some politicians had posted holiday greetings on social media um, that made it appear as though they were in Alberta over the holidays. And it was also especially worse in Alberta because the premier at first refused to punish any of his people, which was unlike the response of other political party leaders across the country who stripped uh, their traveling political representatives of various duties and privileges. And eventually, uh, Premier Jason Kennedy in, in Alberta was forced to do some firings and strippings of duties because the outrage in the population was so intense and so ongoing, even among uh, his party's usual supporters. So that this seemed very... Um, <sighs> Well, it seemed very significant to the controversies about leaving London in uh, the late 16th and in the 17th century. Okay, so returning to Clapham. Um, so he criticized those who fled London because he believed they were abandoning their responsibilities and because he believed they were trying to avoid God's will, trying to evade his reach in case God might want to smite them with illness. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, before I got sidetracked by sun-seeking Canadian politicians, Clapham believed the illness was not caused by contagion, but fully and only was the result of God's will. So his stance was also an anti-quarantine, excuse me, an anti-quarantine stance. 
uh, in that there's no justification for quarantine if the disease is not infectious. And if God deliver, deliberately makes every specific decision about who is struck down. So Clapham's beliefs were not the sort that were welcomed by state authorities for trying to keep infection rates down by enforcing quarantine orders and forbidding public assemblies. And we can see this as somewhat akin to the frustration mayors and premiers feel across the country when large crowds gather to protest that COVID-19 is a hoax that doesn't exist and that, max, that masks don't work, et cetera. It makes the job of authorities trying to prevent spread much harder, as did the kinds of uh, sermons and writings of people like Hanok Clapham. Okay, so if Clapham was a kind of anti-establishment, anti-authority Puritan type, Lancelot Andrews was his establishment nemesis. Uh, Andrews in 1603 was the Dean of Westminster Abbey. He was the master of Pembroke College, Cambridge. He was a chaplain at the Royal Chapel in Whitehall. Uh, later, he held bishoprics at, of uh, Chichester, Ely, and Winchester, and he became a privy council in 1609, uh, excuse me, a privy councillor in 1609. He was also uh, the leading figure among translators of the King James Bible. So in short, he was a very well-placed professional and very much a part of the elite religious establishment in England and an extremely influential London preacher. During the plague summer of 1603, however, Andrews retreated from London to a country place in Chiswick on the Thames. Uh, and he took the boys of Westminster School, the students, with him. So he protected the children and, and brought them somewhere safe. But in doing, so, in doing so, he also abandoned his London parish. His own parish, uh, St. Giles Cripplegate, was, was quite hard hit by the plague. It, it recorded uh, 2,879 burials during that summer, mostly from plague. And of course, Andrews, their pastor, was not there to advise and comfort and advocate for them. Andrews was probably aware that his flight from London would be viewed unfavorably by many. Um, as some vicars did stay in London with their parishioners and, and they were compared fav favorably to those who did not. So in uh, Chiswick that summer, August 12th, Andrews preached a plague sermon. His words are very different from those that Clapham was spreading. The plague, he preached, works through natural means. The plague operates and is spread through nature. It's contagious and has natural causes. However, Andrews was still a religious minister and he stressed that these natural means were the secondary and not the primary cause of the disease. The primary cause was metaphysical and therefore it was for religious divines, preachers, et cetera, to diagnose the cause of plague. So Andrews, preached there a, a very orthodox church position in 17th century England, the one that was adopted by establishment leaders and governments. The primary cause is God's will, but the secondary cause is natural, is natural and it's contagious, etc. The disease is contagious. Andrews does point to specific sins as uh, causing the plague. And specifically, he blames what he calls new inventions. And in that category, he includes new meats in diet, new fashions in apparel, and I think particularly significantly, new tricks, opinions, and fashions in divine worship. <laughs> 
The first two, New Meats and Diet and New Fashions in Apparel, are part of a common discourse that criticized increased consumption and commercialism um, of life in London. The idea that Londoners had become decadent and overly concerned uh, with the vain pleasures of the world to the detriment of their Christian duties and ultimately their souls. And this was a common religious criticism of London and Londoners. But that third point, uh, that God was punishing his people because some were guilty of new tricks, opinions, and fashions in divine worship is interesting. In that it, what it is essentially is a criticism of all kinds of Protestant sects that had developed after the Protestant Reformation and the break from the Catholic Church. And it's a push to punish those who wanted religious reforms that the official Church of England that, that Andrews is so closely associated with had rejected. Now, Henoch Clapham, if not through his whole life, certainly at various points in his life and career, fallen into that category as belonging to or preaching the ideas of a more extreme reformist uh, Puritan uh, type of perspective. One thing we see in Andrew's sermon is that while he sees sin as the cause of God bringing on the plague, he doesn't seem to see a one-to-one -one correspondence between the victim of the plague and, and uh, the sinner uh, who brought the plague on. Okay, so he suggests that tendencies towards sin in various population groups has caused a plague on the population overall. So it makes sense then that Andrew finds justification for fleeing London because he believes God is punishing the people of England for the sins, the sins of the many. But he is doing it through a contagion that operates by natural means and therefore can be avoided and he's not punishing individuals for the sins of individuals. He also pointed out in his plague sermon, so he's clearly justifying himself in some way, um, that, that in scripture, in the Bible, there are cautions against exposing oneself to contagion. And those cautions come in in scripture when, when it uh, places, when it, advocates for restrictions on contact with lepers. So that also justifies attempts to get away from plague hit locations, uh, you know, the kinds of attempts that were criticized by people like Clapham. So his position offers him, offers him cover against critics like Clapham. But it, it's also very much a position that aligns with the efforts of the government to impose quarantine and other kinds of restrictions to prevent the spread of infection and to do whatever's possible to prevent the spread of infection. So when Hinoch Clapham published the epistle discourse, discoursing upon the present pestilence in 1603 with his controversial views, he got himself in trouble. He was investigated by the Bishop of London and that Bishop of London chose Lancelot Andrews to question him. Clapham faced two allegations stemming from his pamphlet. One, that the pamphlet created disorder by denying that the plague was contagious. Since government policy was based on the belief that the plague was contagious and royal orders prohibited that one publish the opinion that it wasn't contagious, that one need not stay away from the infected and that it was uncharitable to avoid the infected. Because that was government policy, this got Clapham in trouble. The second allegation against Clapham stemmed 
uh, that stemmed from the pamphlet was that he suggested that the afflicted died because of their lack of faith in God. So Clapham was, in fact, imprisoned for this and served three years. Um, even though the punishment for a preacher breaking the, these laws was supposed to merely be prohibition from preaching, but he, he, they came down really heavy on him. And it's quite likely that Clapham made things worse for himself because he attacked ministers like Andrews, who had retreated to safety in the countryside and, and even suggested that the evil they did by leaving London was worse than the plague itself. So I've, uh, I've delineated the conflict between these two religious men um, in order to demonstrate how these religious perspectives had real world consequences, that what was religious was not divorced from what was social and political. Um, the viewpoints of uh, Clapham and Andrews were affected by their experiences in London and by what they wanted to see happening in London. And their viewpoints, in turn, helped to influence what people did in London in response to the plague. And I've also delineated it to make clear that even within a 17th century English Protestant worldview, there could be conflicting viewpoints about the meaning and operation of the plague. Okay, so that's today's lecture. Um, their final lecture for this week will be on uh, Ben Johnson's epigrams.